Chapter Nine of Bill Bolton and Hidden Danger by Noel Sainsbury. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Chapter Nine: The Offer and the Threat. Good evening, Mister Bolton," said the intruder mockingly. "Good evening," Bill replied politely. "I don't suppose it's of any use to inquire how you got in." The man's manner rather flabbergasted Bill. If there had been any suspicion of menace in Sanders' attitude, Bill would have gone for him straight away with his fists. Not the slightest, Mr. Bolton. And then with a nod and a smile. Excuse me. As Bill was still holding the curtain aside, Sanders stepped past him into the lounge. On the table beside the lamp and book, he laid a little automatic. No need for that, I hope he remarked pleasantly and dropped into an armchair quite within reach of the revolver he gave bill that curious quick confidential nod then took out a gold case and lighted a cigarette he blew a thin spiral of smoke into the air with obvious enjoyment for cool nerve the man's manner took bill's breath away without going into details he said offhandedly I have as much right here as you, so you'll pardon me if I make myself at home, won't you? Sit down, Bolton. He pointed to a small seat at the side of the hearth. Thanks, I'll stand. But I said, sit down. Mr. Sanders' voice was not raised in the least, but his words came at Bill like an order. A trifle dazed, he sank into the chair. There was no reason why he shouldn't have hurled the lamp in Sanders' face and in the darkness pitched the table on top of him but instead for no reason he could give bill obeyed him and sat waiting for him to speak naturally curious to fathom the reason for this visit bill was astounded by his attitude considering what had happened in the motorboat thought i'd find you here bolton so i've dropped in for a chat bill leaned back looked at him but said nothing mr sanders raised his eyebrows but the tone of his voice did not alter i take it that you're a straightforward sort of fellow bolton you know where you stand with them i bear no malice for this afternoon's performance in fact i admire you at the present moment you're hating me like poison and the only justification you have is that i didn't knock before i entered you're so remarkably polite tonight murmured bill you might have carried your politeness a little further again sanders gave his quick nod and smiled it isn't always wise to knock bolton for instance you might have mistaken my politeness since it's an informal hour to call you might not have invited me in and i hate talking on doorsteps i want a serious talk with you bolton bill made no comment you know bolton he went on knocking the ash from his cigarette you're on a fool's errand quite bluntly you're taking part in a losing game i'm being plain with you your side hasn't the foggiest hope of success for frankly i hold all the cards well and so what look here he punctuated his words with a long forefinger haven't you brains enough to see you're being made a cat's paw you're the one that's to do the dirty work you are the lad that's to run the risks and take all the hard knocks how do you like the job i'm not kicking said bill sanders smiled again well how much are you getting out of it that's the point oh yes it's not my business i know your type stupid loyal i admire stupidity and loyalty because they are generally exerted in a good cause but when they are wasted qualities wasted on one of the worst scoundrels in america it pains me i'm a student of these things bolton it's part of a lawyer's job to weigh motives a lawyer's bill looked surprised certainly he returned affably it's an honourable enough profession i started to read for the english bar and chucked it i'm a londoner by birth you see but i had a knack for the law in america i've practised ten years as an attorney however my energies at present are devoted to tracking down a scoundrel named evans do you follow me go on 
mr sanders nodded again thank you i'll come to the point at once but i wanted you to understand the situation i intend to get this mr evans and get him i shall soon very soon much sooner than he expects there is no way out of it for him i will get him in the end and the end is not far off the pleasant look had gone from his eyes and his mouth was hard why do you want him bill blurted out and a moment later would have done anything to withdraw his words ah sanders cried i thought so he has been clever enough to conceal that exactly so that is part of his game well my young friend it's part of mine too it is nobody's business at present but mr evans and my own and i tell you there is no sacrifice i wouldn't make to meet that man face to face alone for ten minutes look here bolton to come to brass tacks how much do you want in hard cash to tell me where evans is at this moment sanders leaned forward his glowering eyes fixed upon bill's face bill stared back at him and an angry devil rose within the lad bribery so that was the object of his visit and the man certainly played his cards well he insinuated that mr evans was a scoundrel that bill himself was being made a tool that was bad enough and the astuteness of his argument was apparent but the bribery business stung young bolton's pride he sprang to his feet determined to lash out at the white grinning face sanders held up his hand reading his purpose bolton i'm delighted i can see you're a good fellow you refuse to give away your man if you had fallen for that i wouldn't have had much respect for you would i what the blazes are you getting at now demanded bill do sit down my dear chap again came that quick nod i've no respect for a fellow who sells his boss cheaply i'm not asking you to do that bolton then what just this why not come over to my side why not leave a sinking ship and come aboard a sound one whatever you're getting out of this game in hard cash i'll double row in with me bolton you won't regret it nothing doing bill spoke slowly and emphatically you won't change your mind not for a million oh i was going to do better than that in fact my suggestion is that you come in partnership with me i know that your father is a wealthy man very wealthy but millions of dollars are not to be despised by anyone there are very big things at stake bolton very big indeed he leaned forward his eyes fixed on bills the smoke from his cigarette curling up between them like a banner well don't misunderstand me bolton i don't mean that you're to leave mr evans oh not at all no need for you to have a row with him or anything of the sort no no you can go on exactly as you are doing carry out whatever he has sent you here to do only there will be a little understanding between us two bolton and no one except ourselves will know anything about it to prove i am in earnest i will give you money now if you want it won't you shake on it young man he held out his hand with as friendly a smile as bill had ever seen well well just this bill said evenly i'm not posing as a saint but i tell you to your face i think you're one of the lowest sorts of cads i've ever met you're not clever enough to get mr evans yourself so you come sneaking along and try to bribe one of his friends but you've struck the wrong guy you can keep your filthy money you can offer a share of your rotten business whatever it is to anybody who is rotten enough to go in with you is that plain english or do you want me to make it plainer as if bill had touched a button sanders face changed gone was his cordial air his friendly smile in its place an evil look of anger and wounded pride he had failed in his mission and he knew he had failed but bill could see that he wasn't the man to take failure lying down 
with an impatient gesture mr sanders flung his cigarette into the fireplace and got to his feet white spots showed on his nostrils bolton he said in low suppressed tones neither men nor boys trifle with me you'll learn that before you're much older i've given you your chance and you've refused to take it now i shall give you my orders orders bill laughed at him i will give you till to-morrow night to obey my orders or the consequences for young charlie evans and some other people will be sudden and uh, not pleasant by nine o'clock to-morrow evening as a deadline you will be in gring's hotel in stamford connecticut you will ask for mr harold johnson and you will tell him exactly where mr evans is to be found when you meet johnson you will nod as i have a habit of doing and you will say zenas which happens to be my first name you will also pass johnson your word of honor that you will quit this game for good stamford is a long way from here temporized bill but you have an excellent plane at parker's and clayton sanders laughed shortly this is not a lone hand i'm playing bolton i have an organization behind me and it is a thoroughly efficient one what i don't know about you and particularly your doing since that youngster charlie brought you his father's message would not be worth writing home about and if i refuse bill crossed his legs and looked at him with as much insolence as he could command if you refuse mr midshipman bolton your friend charlie whom my men caught up this morning and the girl deborah will have to take the consequences of your bullheadedness slowly bill got to his feet so that's your filthy threat is it he cried you hold that over my head well mr zenas sanders two can play at your game bill took a step forward prepared to spring on him the man did not move a smile had come back to his face and again he gave a quick little nod look out bolton don't do anything foolish bill followed the direction of his eyes in the corner of the alcove appearing between the folds of the curtain was the long blue-black barrel of a rifle and it was pointed at bill's breast you see sneered sanders it would have paid you to become my friend you haven't the option now nine o'clock to-morrow night by the latest at gring's hotel bolton or you know the rest sanders slipped behind the curtain out of sight at the same moment the barrel of the gun disappeared with a cry bill snatched up his automatic from the table where sanders had overlooked it and darted into the hall but the hall was empty no sound came from any part of the house end of chapter nine chapter ten of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter ten another intruder for several minutes bill stood still and listened not even a board creaked the house was as quiet as a tomb of one thing he felt certain mr zenas sanders and his bodyguard had left the place for good there would be no more visitors to-night he looked at his wrist-watch it was quarter to eleven fifteen minutes more and he would slip out of the back door and make his way over to twin heads harbor more than ever now he wanted to get in touch with ezra parker two heads would be much better than one in this predicament he must have advice too much hung on the decision he must make he dared not rely on his own judgment alone but there must be some way out of this mysterious business parker that clear-headed yankee would be able to suggest the proper course to follow if anybody could the last thing to do before leaving was to make sure that the garage was still lighted up parker must not fail their rendezvous and now bill realized that it was no longer necessary to leave lights burning all over the house 
pocketing the small automatic which mr sanders had so thoughtlessly provided he picked up his flashlight and set about switching off electrics in the various rooms working his way through the house he came to the butler's pantry even in full sunshine it must have been depressing with only the narrow beam of his flash to illumine it the place was dank enough to plunge the most cheerful person into a mood of melancholy bill gazed at the wall with its jail-like row of keys each bearing a small tag with the name of a room in diminutive handwriting above the keys was an ordinary glass frame which enclosed the indicators of bells from the rooms it seemed as if he were watching the still heart of the house with wires leading like bloodless arteries to the gaunt and distant chambers suddenly bill flashed his torch full upon the wall he had thought he saw one of the indicators move the bell had not rung or he had not heard it but he could have sworn that he had seen one of the discs tremble he peered closer for a full minute he watched the indicators but now could discern no movement nerves he muttered angrily this darned house is making a woman of me a glance at his watch showed that it lacked but five minutes to the hour he strolled to the end of the kitchen passage returned and went into the hall to get his cap the wind had risen he could hear it swishing through the trees outside a long low whine in the pine needles in vivid contrast to the deadly stillness inside the house he was returning to the pantry on his way to the back door when he felt his heart jump and then stand still clear and unmistakable the tinkling of an electric bell bill leapt into the butler's pantry and his eyes scanned the double row of indicators on the wall not one of them moved by the fraction of an inch a soft faint whir sounded again in some room of the house a finger was pressed upon an electric button bill went into the passage and listened the sound was much clearer now it seemed to come from behind the closed door across the corridor that door was of heavy oak and the key was in the lock even without the white tag that hung from it bill knew it was a second entrance to the cellar or so charlie had told him what if the door led to a part of the cellar that he had not already inspected a moment's thought made it plain that mr evans must have left the key in the door to prevent the insertion of a duplicate from the cellar side the ringing stopped abruptly why on earth bill wondered should there be an electric bell in the cellar charlie had mentioned no such thing and who could have been ringing it and why for a few moments bill could not decide whether to investigate or simply to ignore the matter there was however the possibility that it was meant to be a message or a warning to him and he decided to find out its meaning at once extinguishing his flashlight he gently turned the key in the cellar door he pulled the door open and quickly stepped behind it nothing could be heard from the cellar not a rustle not a whisper after waiting a moment or two bill ventured to move into the open doorway a musty smell floated up the stairs a smell of earth and stagnant air with his outstretched foot bill explored until he found the first step very gingerly he descended into the darkness his hand touching the stone wall at his side for guidance when he reached the bottom he paused again to listen but he could hear nothing save his own breathing then like a sudden stab through his brain the bell pealed again this time it was quite close to him he felt that if he reached out he could have touched it the flashlight was still clenched in his hand he hesitated then pressed the button and held the light above his head the cellar vast and irregular stanchioned by square stone pillars lay before him streaked by the wavering shadows cast by his light bill saw at once that it was not the place he had gone over with charlie arched wine bins mostly empty made dim hollows along the walls but still he could not locate the sound with a final whir the ringing stopped and the conviction swept into his mind that he had been listening not to a call bell but to a telephone 
yet he could see nothing that remotely resembled a telephone instrument a bare heavy table with a couple of benches beside it stood in the middle of the floor and he could see nothing else in the dimness save the blank arched walls ready to snap off his light at the first hint of any lurking enemy bill pushed forward and explored two short bays that ran out at right angles to the main wine cellar but without result why he deliberated should there be a telephone in this underground spot so far as his observation had gone there was no phone upstairs and a cellar seemed a mighty queer place to install one to conceal the instrument seemed stranger still bill noticed that a passage led off to the left avoiding some tumbled packing cases on the floor he went forward to see what he could find after he had gone about ten yards he was brought up short by a heavy door like the one upstairs this door also had its key on the lock it was a primitive sort of lock and made a loud click as he turned it too loud for bill's taste in the circumstances he let a couple of seconds go by before venturing to proceed his hand was on the key ready to pull the door open when something happened that made him stop and listen intently he snapped off his light from behind the iron-studded door he imagined but was by no means certain that he had heard a sound after a minute or two of silence he concluded that it must have been the wind stirring in a loose grating in the passage beyond but presently he thanked his stars he had switched off the light for suddenly he heard quite clearly the sound of footsteps approaching on the other side of the unlocked door the situation called for swift action in the blinding darkness he quickly estimated whether he could possibly get through the cellar and up into the house in time to avoid discovery it was not likely but there was a shallow niche in the wall behind the door and he slipped into it praying that he would remain concealed when the door opened the footsteps grew louder then drew to a stop a pause and then he heard the mumble of a voice from behind the door somebody was talking over the telephone in there of that bill felt sure but the voice was too low for him to distinguish the words curiosity impelled bill to risk pulling the door open half an inch and he peered through the crack into the space beyond instantly the voice ceased the place was pitch dark and though bill stared till his eyeballs ached he could see nothing then in the inky blackness he heard a slight rustle what was the man doing even though bill had used the utmost care in opening the door the stranger must have heard him glued to the crack he closed his eyes and listened at first he heard nothing then it came again a faint rustle it was nearer now almost at the door somebody or something was moving stealthily toward him bill drew back and none too soon bang a heavy body crashed against the farther side of the door it slammed open and back against the cellar wall with a crash loud enough to wake the dead bill had just time to realize that had he remained at the crack he would have had a nasty blow when sinewy arms gripped him and he found himself fighting for his life End of chapter 10chapter eleven of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter eleven from bad to worse with unerring skill the more amazing because of the inky darkness bill's opponent grasped his right wrist twisted it and the automatic dropped to the floor the flashlight bill had discarded at the man's first spring in vain he sought to slip his free hand beneath the other's armpit to try for a half nelson or some other effective hold the man was as sinewy and lithe as a snake and blocked bill's every move he tried jiu-jitsu but here again he was foiled and only with the greatest difficulty was he able to keep those tenacious hands from his throat panting and straining the two swayed back and forth 
crashing into packing cases banging into walls their hot breath on each other's faces twisting slipping recovering and drenched in perspiration from their terrific exertions then in one of his lunges bill stepped on the electric torch and instantly a dim glow spread along the floor and threw their figures and faces into relief against the gloom bill bolton gasped the stranger and released him osceola too winded for further speech the friends stared at each other great snakes exclaimed the young seminole chief at last a jolly way you have of receiving callers well why on earth didn't you come to the front door and ring the bell like a christian growled bill what's the idea snooping in through the wine cellar and scaring me half to death this confounded house is creepy enough without you adding to the spooks the front door retorted osceola was out of the question how did i know you were in the place sanders has his men posted all around here he came out of the back door with another guy less than half an hour ago and i saw them bill picked up the torch and the automatic before replying you don't happen to know how they got in he asked i locked the back entry from the inside so they couldn't have come that way osceola shook his head no they got in the same way i did their footprints are all over the place but which way is that there's an old shed in the woods about fifty yards from the house mr evans told me about it once upon a time it was used for storing firewood and it connects with the cellar by a kind of tunnel they broke in there picked the cellar lock and went on up into the house but they couldn't have come through the cellar i found both doors locked they didn't have to come through here there's a circular stair that leads from where the phone is up through that wall and out into the hall above bill nodded remembering the speed with which sanders and his man had disappeared just where and how does it connect with the hall there's a sliding panel in the wall by the fireplace <laughs> you and sanders said bill seem to know a lot more about this place than i do mr evans put me hep how sanders got his information i don't know but he's evidently got it all down pat that old brick shed out there takes some finding it's all overgrown with vines and bushes i had a job finding it myself but tell me osceola bill perched on the edge of the table how did you happen to be telephoning in here how did you get here i must get straightened out on this business before i hike over to see parker at twin heads harbor tonight parker flew me up to clayton from new canaan the chief told him then he drove me over here in his car or that is i left him where the road to turner's leaves the harbor highway and came the rest of the way on foot please start at the beginning won't you i'm still at sea all right all right don't get all head up now well deborah lightfoot the girl i'm engaged to what not the girl on the island evan's secretary she's the girl but you never told me you were engaged didn't i well we're going to get married next year just as soon as i'm graduated from carlisle gee that's fine said bill i certainly congratulate you both but say let's get on with the business end of this gab begin with mr evans when you saw him or heard from him first have it your own way grinned osceola i came out from new york on an early train to new canaan yesterday afternoon after seeing your father off for washington the servants were in a great state about the night before it seems that the shooting woke them up after you and charlie got out of the house i read your note and reckoned that since neither you nor charles nor the plane were on the premises you'd managed to get off all right you had told me in your note to stay put till i heard from you so i stuck round the house all evening waiting for a wire or a phone call i was especially worried about deborah she graduated from barnard in june and shortly after this flying fish affair was cleaned up i got her the job with mr evans i knew she was up here in maine with him 
but from what you wrote it looked as if old evans had got himself mixed up in a thug war or something and i didn't want my girl to be stopping bullets mind you deb can take care of herself in a mix-up better than most men she's a swell shot and she can throw a tomahawk as true as any brave in this seminole nation great guns i had no idea she was a seminole she sure is grinned his friend deb is sachem of the water moccasin clan in her own right she's a sort of stink cousin of mine and brains well she's two years younger than i am and yet she's a year ahead of me in college she's whoa laughed bill i'll take it for granted and all that that she's the most wonderful girl in the world get back to your story now you were worried because she was up here you said right i was but i decided to hang round your place for the night and wait for your message which never came if i didn't hear by morning my plan was to come along up here by train whether you needed me or not and then mr evans turned up eh he did the sound of the plane sent me running out to the hangar in the middle of breakfast at first when i saw the loaning i thought you had come back then old evans piled out and introduced parker who had flown him down i took them into the house and we had breakfast together well he's got a nerve disappearing on us in the first place and then taking my plane to do it in yes he said he hadn't had a chance to let you know or to ask your permission to use the loaning matters suddenly came to a head and he had to get to stamford as soon as possible it seems that some of sanders crowd hang out there and they were up to something he couldn't get the hang of yes i know they're coming up here in a boat of some kind they're after something that belongs to mr evans that's what he said i mean he described sanders and told me that his crowd was trying to steal something from him why doesn't evans move it to some safe deposit and let us out of all this hullabaloo well the funny part of it is that he doesn't know where it is and apparently sanders and his lads do that is a funny one grunted bill evans the owner doesn't know where this valuable something is and the would-be robbers do that's what he told me all right well what is it they're raising such a rumpus about does evans himself know bill was getting sarcastic over the situation search me he didn't say well i think it's the limit here i get all head up thinking that at last i'm going to find out something definite about this mess and you tell me you don't know evans thinks i guess that it's less dangerous for us not to know he's a pretty good egg bill frowned then began to chuckle <laughs> sanders offered me a couple of million or so if i'd go in with him can you beat that so whatever the blooming loot is it's worth money looks like it but let me finish i was just starting to talk to deb over the private line in the other room when you came butting in and i had to ring off you may not know it but i'm rather anxious to finish that conversation oh go to the phone now if you must said bill resignedly i'll wait no i'll get this off my chest first you're in almost as much of a sweat as old evans was at breakfast this morning he wouldn't talk while the waitress was in the room so things were a bit jerky but when we'd finished eating and one of your cars was waiting to run him down to stamford he told me about sanders then he described this place told me how to get into it through the sub cellar and where the short line phone to the island was hidden he suggested that parker take some sleep and then fly me up here so i could keep an eye on deborah to finish the story parker and i took turns flying the bus and here i am did mr evans say what i was supposed to be doing inquired bill he left while charlie and i were asleep i've had no instructions yes he wants you to keep careful watch on the sanders crowd so you can locate what they're trying to steal hm, a nice soft job that how am i going to find something when i don't know what it is the man's got bats in his belfry well i don't know but that's what he said by the way where's charlie upstairs 
he is not and that's another thing that gets my goat while his father flies on without a word sanders gets the boy bill went on to tell osceola of the day's happenings you see he concluded i'm between two fires it's the dickens of a mess if i go to stamford and pretend to play in with that gang i can't be watching them up here and if i don't go there's no telling what sanders may do with that kid my plan before you came along was to meet ezra parker at the harbor and see what his advice would be good idea said osceola thoughtfully he had been squatting on his heels indian fashion and now stood up hello he cried there goes that telephone again i guess deb got tired of waiting how did she know you were here it was that bill jingling that brought me down here i called her up when i got in the cellar jim answered and said she was out on the rocks so she called me back he hurried off to the other end of the cellar with bill close behind him holding the light osceola fumbled with a brick in the wall it came away in his hands and he pushed his arm into the cavity a panel in the wall swung outward revealing the fact that it was not brick at all but cleverly painted wood the ringing of the bell immediately became louder for in the open niche stood a telephone the chief picked up the receiver hello hello bill heard him say yes this is osceola yes deb i'm all right bill is here we mistook each other for sanders men in the dark that's why i rang off but everything is okay now no i don't mean exactly that sanders has kidnapped charlie and what are you saying great guns is that so yes i can hear firing hang on as long as you can don't give up we'll be with you just as soon as possible he hung up slammed shut the camouflage panel and turned to bill the devil to pay deb and old jim are barricaded in the hut on pig island sanders men have got the place surrounded End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Berard. chapter twelve on the way we're a pretty pair of fools cried bill i agree with you osceola usually stoical under trying conditions was visibly upset while we're scrapping and swapping stories that girl of mine is being kidnapped by those ruffians but they haven't got into the house yet bill reminded him but what can those two do against so many after what sanders said to you we should have been prepared for this for the love of mike bill hold that light steady i can't find the brick that manipulates the panel to the woodshed tunnel there that's better a section of the cellar wall opened and the light from the torch shone on a flight of stone steps leading into the earth wait a jiffy till i pick up my rifle the young seminole disappeared then returned with the gun in his hands lucky i decided to tackle you with my fists rather than shoot in the dark got everything you need yep then turn the light on the wall to your left third brick from the bottom there he pulled it out fumbled in the aperture for a moment and the cellar door slid shut gosh it's dark bill went down the steps and along the tunnel sending a light beam before him how did you manage to navigate without a flash my race as you know see better in the dark than you pale faces but it wasn't easy just the same some of the roof is down farther ahead and i barked my shin on one of the stone blocks rotten air in here too mr evans said that turner was quite a guy at smuggling in his day he told me that the house is a regular warren of secret passages what time is it anyway just eleven forty five parker ought to be over the house in fifteen minutes that is if he comes he will declared the seminole he said he would if he wakes up in time you mean after those two long hops he'll be a dead up oh not so bad i flew the plane most of the way up here confessed osceola so parker got plenty of sleep on the trip 
good boy your instructor is proud of you look out here are those blocks you tripped over before they scrambled over the debris and a few moments later came to another flight of stone steps osceola manipulated the sliding door at the top very much in the same manner as he had closed the one to the cellar bill switched off his light and they entered a small one-roomed building here the indian led him past a broken doorway and through a dense thicket of evergreen and brambles then they reached the more open woods osceola paused i ambled over these woods the day we corralled our friend the baron he remarked and i took a look at the outside of turner's then keep the moon on your right and you're bound to hit the harbor it's between two and a half and three miles over there and where do you think you're going asked bill in surprise over to the cove and out to pig island but you have no boat i'll swim out why you're crazy osceola i know you're a marvel in the water but there isn't a swimmer living who could breast that current believe me i tried it and i know well i can make a try at it too can't i what's the use hike along with me and we'll be over there with the loaning in half the time you could swim that distance in easy water anyway there's your rifle you'd have to leave that behind don't be a sap old fellow you can't fight ten or a dozen of the sanders tribe with your fists osceola who had led his class at carlisle and would captain the football team in the fall was a young man whose brain worked fast moreover he was never afraid to admit he might be wrong and to profit by another's advice okay he said after a moment's hesitation i guess i let myself get carried away a bit i'll go with you let's be on our way good egg i know you're worried half sick about deborah and i don't blame you you lead on old scout we'll make it yet osceola started off at a sharp dog trot that he could keep up for hours if need be bill ran lightly behind him glad to be in the open air and away from that uncanny house at last a ten-mile breeze blowing in from the sea rustled the tree-tops and shadows cast by a full moon danced over the undergrowth clouds were banking to the eastward the salt tang of the ocean was in the air bill sensed rain or a storm and was glad that the cloud formation creeping upward would shortly blot out the silvery light should they be forced to land on pig island in moonlight nearly as bright as day the odds would be all with their enemies osceola with that natural bump of direction which is inherent in all races of american indians struck an overgrown deer track and followed it bill running on his second wind saw the young chief slacken his pace for an instant then dart ahead at a stiffer gait here he comes the indian called over his shoulder if we hustle we'll reach the shore soon after he lands the white lad could hear nothing but the soft thud of his own footsteps and the gentle swish of the night wind in the tree-tops then dimly at first came the almost imperceptible drone of an engine far away within a very few minutes the hum grew to a roar and the dark shape and tail-light of an airplane passed over their heads flying low in the same direction they were travelling osceola slowed down to a brisk walk the ground sloped upward and rocky outcroppings made running impossible then he stopped altogether and waited for his companion there we are he pointed forward and down bill who was not sorry for the breather saw that they stood on the crest of the rise straight ahead the ground slanted sharply downward through breaks in the foliage a wide stretch of moonlit water could be seen floating gently on the rippling cove near the shore lay the seaplane you're a wonder osceola how were you able to draw a bead on parker like that i was sure we were in for at least a mile's tramp along the shore before we'd get within hailing distance nothing mysterious about it that's a cove off the main harbor you're looking at parker told me of his rendezvous with you i knew about this cove and made it a bit more definite that's all i'll give him the signal and we'll go on down 
two sharp barks of a fox came from osceola's throat immediately the idling hum of the airplane motor increased to a roar awakening forest echoes and the amphibian commenced to move through the water toward the shore without a word the two friends scrambled down the rocky incline to meet it is that go chief called ezra parker's voice as they neared the water sure is and i've got bill bolton with me good enough answered the aviator as they came on to the narrow beach i'll be ya bill rearin to go ezra and i reckon that's what we've got to do pronto anything up plenty sanders has got charlie and the gang's over at pig island right now trying to capture deborah and old jim gosh all hemlock exploded ezra things are poppin that's satin and that's not the half of it cut in osceola if bill doesn't hike down to stamford connecticut and prove to members of the sanders outfit down there that he is out of this thing for keeps those devils threaten to put charlie out of the way and deborah too if they can get her well that shaw is the limit ezra's tongue was filled with concern jump aboard boys while i run her out in the harbor there's no tellin who may be sneakin round in these woods no sense takin any more chances than we have to the chief swung himself on to the amphibian's deck which ran from amidships forward to her nose below the two cockpits and inverted motor bill meanwhile quickly doffed his clothes which together with sanders automatic he flung to the seminole he waded into the water pushed the plane out until she floated clear and walked out until he could grasp a wing-tip after much heaving and hauling for the water was up to his armpits he managed to swing the plane around until her nose was pointed toward the mouth of the cove thanks bill said ezra and osceola gave his pal a hand aboard this place is too narrow for manoeuvring i was wondering how i could get her out of here give me a towel bill's teeth were chattering there's one in the locker in your cockpit ezra lucky you didn't try swimming over to the island tonight, osceola if anything is colder than this main ocean when the sun's off it i've yet to find it with osceola he piled into the rear cockpit then while parker taxied the plane out to mid-harbor bill got into his clothes parker snapped off the ignition and twisted around in his seat now let's have the lowdown on this bill bill climbed down to the deck and gave him a short outline of the events of the day and evening kind of between the devil and the deep sea aren't we he finished grimly time's more than money now so hop in aft with the chief and let me in the fore cockpit i'm going to fly the bus there ought to be a couple of repeating rifles and ammunition in the locker aft pass one of them out to me will you osceola ezra can use the other you two stick on headphones while i'm driving see if you can't come to some decision about the stamford business as parker climbed out of the fore cockpit and went aft bill hopped into the vacated pilot seat a rifle and ammunition were passed to him he made sure that the magazine was full then pulled forth the helmet and goggles from a small locker these he put on cast a hurried glance aft and satisfying himself that his companions were ready for the take-off he swished on the ignition End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sansbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter thirteen pig island again bill sent the amphibian roaring into the night wind pulled her off the rippling waters of the harbor and skimming the twin bluffs at the entrance sent his bus speeding seaward a bank to starboard brought pig island dead ahead and bill saw that the moon glare playing on the islet threw every detail into full relief on the instant he changed his plan counting on the heavy cloud formation which was slowly spreading upward from the east his first idea had been to land near the shore and after securing the plane on one of the beaches to rush the besiegers under cover of darkness 
now that the moonlight doomed such procedure to certain failure he proceeded to climb at six hundred feet he levelled off and sent the loaning speeding in a circle around the island the house a one-story bungalow built of native stone with hollow tile roof stood on a craggy knoll near the centre of the island bill saw that this slight eminence held unusual factors of defence not only was it impossible to look down on the house from any other point on the island but the rocky ground sloped steeply on all sides from the top of the knoll the one bad feature of the place was the number of large boulders nature had splattered up and down the incline behind twelve or fifteen of these big stones and completely ringing the little fortress above them crouched the party of armed men as he circled bill saw the flashes from the gangsters rifles and the answering flashes from the house he noticed that there was method in the attack and one that was likely to succeed in the capture of the bungalow there would come a spurt of firing from one section of the attacking group on the hill which naturally drew the two in the house to that side in order to repel a possible assault immediately the men on the farther side out of range from the house would dash ahead to take refuge behind boulders further up the knoll once under new cover they would start a fusillade which gave the men on the opposite side a chance to advance three of the gang kept together and every time they moved they picked up a heavy log and carted it up to the next boulder it was evident that once sanders got his crew well up to the house these men covered by the fire of their companions would dash forward and batter in the door with their ram three bodies lying stark on the hillside bespoke the courage and straight shooting of the besieged but the rush must come soon and the ultimate capture of the place was inevitable unless we get busy and get busy pronto muttered bill he gave a lightning glance behind him ezra parker and osceola were firing from the rear cockpit but so far without apparent result to hit any object on the ground with a rifle bullet from a speeding airplane is a difficult feat but bill knew that the odds were against the gangsters for it is even more difficult to hit an airplane in flight that is if she is being driven by an experienced pilot much to the disgust of osceola who did not understand the manoeuvre bill leveled off and headed out to sea a quarter of a mile from the island he turned in his seat and having attracted parker's attention mouthed the words hold fast the two who were squeezed in the small cockpit aft nodded their understanding for an instant or two longer bill waited then assured that they were secure he sent the plane into a wing over this manoeuvre is essentially a climbing turn followed by a diving turn the two aggregating a hundred and eighty degrees the engine is kept running and control is maintained throughout the wing over is entered from level flight at first it is merely a normal turn in which the nose is gradually raised and slipping and skidding are to be avoided as usual elevation of the nose may be commenced simultaneously with the application of the bank if so the stick must be pulled back very slowly at first as otherwise a stall will result and the wing over will be unsatisfactory in flight training unless the student's judgment is particularly accurate it is advisable for him to delay elevation of the nose until a bank of fifteen to twenty degrees has been reached bill steadily increased the bank until the amphibian was in a fairly steep reverse control turn with the nose well above the horizon and headed approximately ninety degrees from his original course he then gave the plane down rudder inasmuch as a fairly good speed had been obtained very little rudder was needed had the plane's speed been close to the stalling point he would have used more at the same time bill was careful to use the ailerons firmly to prevent the bank from increasing as the nose dropped below the horizon in response to the rudder the plane assumed the position of a steep reverse controlled spiral except that the engine was running he kept it momentarily in this position then as it approached a heading of a hundred and eighty degrees 
from the entering course he recovered as if from a spiral at the same time raising the plane's nose to level the entire manoeuvre of the wing-over was executed of course in a fraction of the time it takes to describe it bill used it solely because he wished to bring the amphibian back on a course headed for the house on the island in the least time possible he now waved a hand to his companions to make ready then he picked up the rifle he had been sitting on rested its barrel on the cowl of the cockpit and pushed forward the stick over went the nose and down shot the plane in a breath-catching dive to be leveled off with a jerk just beyond the breakers then with all three rifles pouring streams of spitting fire bill sent the airplane hurtling across the knoll at an altitude of less than ten feet above the heads of the cowering gangsters up zoomed the amphibian on the farther side of the hill gained altitude over the water did another wing over and swept back across the knoll but this time behind the house again and again bill repeated these telling evolutions first one side then the other was raked with fire from the plane then he would zoom the house itself in order to further confuse the besiegers on the plane's eighth trip sanders forces broke flesh and blood could no longer stand this death-dealing hail of lead from a plane impossible to hit dragging their wounded with them the routed gangsters dashed pell-mell down to the shore they piled into two motor-boats beached in a cove and in less than no time these two crafts were racing toward the mainland with everything wide open bill let them go defense of the old man and the girl in the house on the hill was one thing the shooting down of cowed men huddled in a couple of boats quite another when he was convinced that the rout was a permanent fact he landed the plane on the water taxied into the same sandy cove from which the gunmen had departed and beached her deborah was waiting on the sand for them osceola was the first overboard and a moment later the two were clasped in each other's arms bill grinned at ezra so far he said as you and i are concerned well we might be a couple of other rocks for all they mind that's all right returned the older man as they went about making the plane secure they're in love we don't exist with them just now don't be so superior you'll be that way yourself some day <laughs> not me scoffed bill oh you don't know what you're talking about i was like you before the right girl came along i don't suppose you've thought any more about the orders sanders gave you you mean not to interfere any more with his plans and to report to that guy in stamford yes and this little adventure has torn the first part of that to pieces you mean the consequences to charlie of course just that sanders will now take it for granted you've decided to stick to the ship in spite of his threats there's no use crying over the milk we've spilt to-night lad we've had a job to do and i'm throwing no bouquets when i tell you it was done noble too bad we couldn't have wiped out the entire crew while we were about it by the way i didn't spot his nibs in that gang did you no sanders wasn't with his men guess distance lends enchantment with mr sanders when there is a good chance of stopping lead that guy hires men to do his fighting take it from me he is sound asleep in his little white bed wherever that may be and i only wish i knew where that said ezra with a chuckle is a worthy thought but it doesn't get us any farther with the matter in hand does it bill was silent for a moment vaguely conscious that the rising cloud formation had at last obscured the moon and the darkness after the brilliant moonlight seemed inky black he racked his brain for a means to outwit their enemy suddenly he laughed what a pack of blithering idiots we are he almost shouted look here ezra sanders doesn't know i was in the bus it's dollars to a penny postage stamp he thinks i'm asleep in my own bed at turner's Maybe that is if he doesn't send someone in there again to-night to find out 
not sanders that guy has a jehovah complex he knows he's a world beater and doesn't hide his knowledge under any bushel either why he's so sure he put cold naked fear into me he'd bet on it you're probably right agreed ezra he's been over to my dump a couple of times he's got one of those bull bubble asters with a man to chauffeur him round nice little job too a three-piece biplane he can fold the wings back when they're folded the hangar space required is only nine feet by thirteen and a half feet by twenty-five that commented bill is very likely the reason he picked on it handy bus to hide but what has a bull verville cw three got to do with the price of spinach nothing except your high hat friend had me up to fix one of his shock absorbers they're of the oleo rubber disc type on those crates you see under loading conditions those rubber discs are in compression and an internal perforated plunger piston simultaneously travels into a loaded oil chamber at the lower end of the strut and interrupted bill this absorbs the impact energy and neutralizes the effect of the rebound which is so prevalent with ordinary rubber spring shock absorbers it cushions the landing shocks to the extent of saving the whole airplane structure from strains which are occasioned by shocks in bad landings over rough ground you win laughed parker up here in this out-of-the-way neck of the woods one forgets that there are other idiots crazy enough to waste time messing round with air buses thanks but oh nothing i got off the track as usual just wanted to say that i got so gall darned mad at that uppish little groundhog sanders the last time he came round belly aching about the job i'd done on his shock absorbers and all because his chauffeur got his training from a correspondence course i told him to get out and stay out no he wasn't on deck tonight i'd know him a mile away well you said that before so we'll take it for granted that if i hop down to stamford tomorrow and give that bozo johnson an earful he won't start in making it nasty for charlie in the meantime i think said ezra we can be reasonably sure that he won't and now you and i had better get up the hill and help jim with the uh dear departed and while we're about that i'm going to wake up the lovers you may not be hungry but i can eat a horse if deborah is as good at cooking now that she has her little indian chief as she was before he came to divert her mind from worthwhile things maybe we can get her to scare up a meal what about charlie we've got to get that kid away from the gang just as soon as we can of course we must but i can think better when my stomach isn't so doggone empty charlie is safe until the deadline that sanders gave me now for the seminoles lucky they're not on their natural habitat you and i would get a tomahawk between the eyes eh osceola he cried End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sansbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fourteen bill blows up clocks in new canaan were striking seven next evening when bill turned the switch on the loanings instrument board which released the retractable landing gear of the plane five or six seconds later he spiraled down on the level field back of the bolton place and taxied toward the hangar wheel blocks in hand he was climbing out of the cockpit when a man ran up from the direction of the bolton garage evening master bill he greeted glad to see you back again hello frank i'm glad to get home myself even though i won't be staying long has my father returned home from washington no sir that is he ain't back in new canaan after i get something to eat i'm taking the buick down to stamford it may be that i'll come back to-night 
but if not i'll need the loaning tomorrow very well sir i'll fill her and give her a thorough looking over some doings there were here the night you left by the time i waked up and got the cops on the phone them guys had beat it there was a wrecked car what had run into a rope stretch out yonder but they took the license plates with em the cops think they can trace the car though well that won't get them anywhere i'll bet a hat the car was stolen anyway i know who the men were i've got a date with one of them to-night is that so sir better let me go with you sir frank was all eagerness there's them what says i ain't so worse in a scrap bill laughed and shook his head thanks just the same frank some other time maybe there won't be any scrapping where i'm going this evening this is just going to be a quiet conference frank looked disappointed well you never can tell sir if it looks like something interesting i hope you'll give us a ring and i'll be wid yer in three shakes of a lamb's tail i'll remember but don't be too hopeful so long now i'm off to get a bite at the house before i start off again so long master bill i'll have the buick round front for you soon as i wheel this crate into the hangar thanks said bill again and marched off toward the house in the kitchen he encountered the cook well if it isn't master bill home again being that buxom female sure as i'm a sinner it's your dinner ye'll be wanting and divil a bit have it cooked yet i give help there an, an hour ago oh that's all right annie but would it be too much trouble to rustle me a couple of sandwiches or maybe three annie hands on hips and arms akimbo looked indignant it's no sandwiches ye'll be getting mr bill in half an hour i'll have something hot and tasty dished up can't you be waiting that long gee i sure can annie but don't bother too much anything will do i'm hungry enough to eat shoe leather now you leave that to me he heard her say as he went toward the front of the house and then up the stairs to his room he shut the door and picked up the french phone from a night table by his bed as soon as central answered he called a stamford number mr evans there he asked when a man's voice answered evans speaking it sounds like bill bolton bill bolton is right mr evans i'm home in new canaan just got here by plane deborah gave me your number then it must be important spill the story boy tell me why you're not up in maine looking after my interests bill told him and it took him more than ten minutes to do so you see he ended while deborah was giving us a midnight lunch on pig island the five of us deborah old jim osceola ezra and myself went into a session of the ways and means committee after some argument it was decided that on charlie's account i must come down here and at least pretend to follow sanders orders to report to johnson at green's hotel anyway yes concurred mr evans i'm afraid there's nothing else that you can do i thought that perhaps you might have some men about rush the joint and capture this johnson kind of tit for tat you know we could swap him back to friend sanders for charlie that would even up things a bit just now it seems to me that they have the bulge on us there's no doubt about it bill they have your plan's a good one but it is impossible but why in the first place although slim johnson is a very young man he is one of the cleverest gangsters outside sing sing secondly if he didn't have a number one organization of cutthroats and gunmen behind him i'd have kidnapped that young gentleman long ago but tell me he went on anxiously what are you fellows up there doing about my boy just this after it was arranged that i should come on here osceola elected himself a committee of one to locate sanders hideout and to get his hands on charlie parker decided to stay on the island to guard deborah for it seems that jim is away most of the time on special duty for you which he wouldn't divulge and quite right too murmured mr evans jim work is a most important factor most important well it's all greek to me and although you're running this show sir and with all due apology i must say it's my opinion that you make a mistake in not putting more confidence in the people who are helping you look at me 
charlie blows in here and we beat it up to maine as fast as my plane and good lead bullets will get us there all kinds of hush stuff when we arrive then you beat it off during the night leaving us in a house that's a warren of secret passages and what not and to make it worse you leave us absolutely no instructions consequently one of us gets kidnapped and the other all but loses his life first by air-gun bullets and some air-gun it must be to shoot that distance and later by drowning then i mistake the people on pig island for your enemies make a fool of myself and darn near get kidnapped into the bargain as a direct result instead of being able to make myself useful in your interest around clayton i have to chase off down here to placate the chief of your enemies there's a lot in what you say replied mr evans but you must understand that this is an extremely serious affair in which an enormous sum of money is involved oh you make me tired snapped bill why i've had a sweet chance to sell you out lock stock and barrel money 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 that's all you so-called big businessmen think of and at that you're the guys we have to thank for the depression is any amount of money worth charlie's life they wouldn't dare they dared with poor little charlie Lindbergh. are you any better than our national hero but i don't like the way you're talking and i don't care a tinker's hoop what you like you're not paying me anything listen to me just as soon as we can find charlie for you i'm through you want those who are helping you to trust you and your judgment yet you won't trust them and seem to have as little respect for human life as did the german high command during the war anything else inquired an angry voice at the other end of the wire yes said bill there is a slight error on my part or what might be construed as an error when i inferred that you willingly risked human life in order to obtain money i naturally made an exception and that is you own valuable life mr evans with this parthian shot bill slapped on the receiver and switched off the telephone extension to his room i guess that'll hold him he muttered gosh i'm glad i got that off my chest he was under the shower in his bath when there was a knock on the door you're wanted on the telephone master william called a maid's voice it's a gentleman wouldn't give his name you tell the gentleman called back bill that i'm busy if he is insisted say that i suggest he can go where snowbells melt the fastest he dressed in a leisurely manner and went down to the dining room where he found a hot meal awaiting him he did full justice to it and about eight thirty he went out the front door climbed in his car and drove off it was a twenty-minute drive down through the ridge country to the city of stamford where he parked his car in a garage off atlantic street from there he walked down back streets and eventually came to gring's hotel he had passed the place many times and knew that it held an unsavory reputation the building was a five-story frame structure and back in the early years of the century it had been a famous hostelry the neighborhood had gradually deteriorated until now the once fashionable tavern reared its ornamental facade amid slums of the worst type the police department had raided the place so often that newspapers no longer regarded that sort of thing as news the hotel still had a reputation for excellent food and service but it drew its patronage almost entirely from the rough element sometimes criminal sometimes merely tough with which every new england manufacturing town is more or less cursed bill ran lightly up the steps to the long veranda a relic of better days paying no attention to the stairs of the lounges in the lobby he crossed to the desk and caught the clerk's attention phone up to mr harold johnson directed bill say that bill bolton is down here and would like to see him one moment sir returned the clerk and spoke a few low words into the phone at the rear of the desk mr johnson will see you he announced a moment later take the elevator to the fourth floor and turn left the room number is forty nine end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen 
of bell bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter fifteen the laundry hamper bill stepped out of the elevator and turned left as the clerk had directed he passed along the corridor until he came to a door marked forty nine he stopped and knocked for a moment he waited marshalling his thoughts then the door swung inwards and he was confronted by a low-browed gorilla of a man who held an automatic in his hand is this mr johnson's room bill inquired who wants to know the man rasped the name is bolton snapped bill i've flown down here from clayton maine especially to see him if that means anything to you let's hear your business if you've got any the man continued to point the revolver at bill's chest my business he said evenly is with mr johnson if you work for the man who sent me here i advise you to tell that to mr johnson and tell it pronto cut the spiel and let him in jake called a soft voice whose owner was hidden by the half-open door jake muttered a surly curse but he stepped aside and bill walked into the room the door slammed behind him and he heard the key turn in the lock he was surprised to find himself in a large and handsomely furnished sitting-room thick hangings of gold brocade were drawn over the windows shutting out the night and with it the air the room was close and filled with tobacco smoke two massive couches upholstered in brocade were set back to back in the centre of the room one end of the sitting-room was filled by a huge mahogany sideboard loaded with bottles and glasses at the other end stood a round card-table covered with dark green felt a number of heavily upholstered armchairs lined the walls and the polished floor was almost completely covered with handsome oriental rugs the walls were hung with a number of really good hunting prints bill glimpsed a door behind the card-table but almost immediately his eyes focused on a young man who sat on the arm of one of the couches he was tall and very slender immaculately dressed in white flannels and a light blue double-breasted sports coat with dull gold buttons bill was astonished to see that the highly manicured nails of his white tapering fingers were tinted carmine his soft voice when he spoke lisped like a girl's i'm slim johnson he said languidly what did you want to see me about buddy bill imitated sanders quick nervous nod zenith he said and waited okay list young johnson bill bolton isn't it the guy that ditched von heimskirk's hash it is bill said shortly i had orders to be here at nine tonight slim johnson glanced at a diamond-studded wristwatch you're three minutes late he purred but i guess that's near enough take one of those chairs and make yourself comfortable i'll talk to you in a few minutes he turned to a man who entered at that moment a stockily built bruiser as rough in his appearance as jake bill sat down in a chair near the wall except for the three men and himself there was no one else in the room though it was apparently furnished to accommodate a large number spill the beans hank johnson smiled pleasantly on his henchman make it snappy though i don't want to keep mr bolton waiting too long hm. you had me drug up here snarled hank i ain't done nothing i couldn't help them guys hijacking the truck if i had made a move they'd have put me on the spot right there oh no johnson smiled come now surely that's a bit of an exaggeration the man glared belligerently about him if any guy says that dem guys didn't have the drop on me he's a liar i fancy that is the unadulterated truth my boy but the trouble is you leave out a few things i ain't left out nothing oh yes you have the purring voice directed itself toward bill you see mr bolton the sad story runs this way last night hank who drives one of my trucks got hijacked with a full load by the miller gang up near ridgefield what he omissed to tell us is that tubby muller passed over half a grand to him for his part of the job 
here at a smothered exclamation from hank his inquisitor put up a slim hand in gentle protest now don't try to look like the picture of injured innocence hank what hank doesn't know mr bolton is that i have watched him for something like this ever since he and tubby got together up at glendale one night last week and although they were not advertising the fact i heard of it last night and this will also be a surprise to hank i was behind the stone wall at the side of the road when he turned over the truck and i saw tubby hand him the money slim johnson's arm shot out like a serpent uncoiling there came a sharp click and hank rolled off the couch on to the floor bill stared at the man's body in horrified amazement then he heard the smooth voice of johnson speak to him again air guns he said pleasantly certainly have their uses johnson slipped the revolver up his sleeve again and crooked a finger at jake take that stiff out of here he ordered in his lisping tones he's spoiling my rug and i paid five grand for it while jake dragged the dead man through the doorway beyond the card table slim johnson drew out a gold case selected a cigarette which he lighted and filled his lungs with smoke no doubt you're shocked by the summary justice you saw meted out he remarked with a return of his languid air treachery has its own reward in this business i'm sorry if it disturbed you mr bolton bill did not reply he was thinking that of all the cold-blooded murders he had ever heard of this was certainly the worst he saw now that the young man's languid effeminacy was but a cloak to camouflage a nature hard as nails and utterly ruthless nobody had to tell him that he himself was in very dangerous waters and that unless he could handle this ladylike monster with kid gloves he too would be removed from the oriental rug as a piece of loathsome debris bill made an effort to be matter-of-fact suppose we come to business he suggested exactly what i was to propose mr bolton or shall i say bill you don't mind if i call you bill do you so much more clubby you know not at all bill felt that anything would be preferable to this silly chatter he therefore took the plunge you want to know where mr evans may be found that is so where is he somewhere in stamford i presume just where i can't say oh come now how about your phone talk at seven twenty what do you know about that slim johnson took a sheet of paper from the inside pocket of his coat just about everything bill old thing he smiled everything except the number you called here's a report of the conversation amusing reading it makes i must say i might mention that we have tapped your home line but the silly fool who listened in didn't wake up until you'd been put through to your friend evans come let's have the number nothing doing johnson bill said steadily although he fully expected to see the gangster's arm shoot forward the next instant as it had done when hank was killed you already know what i said to evans well that goes with you too so far as i'm concerned slim johnson gave him a quizzical glance then he lit another cigarette which he smoked in a long gilded holder for several minutes he stared at a print above bill's head and sent smoke rings toward the ceiling from what i know of your character he said at last and his voice sounded to bill for all the world like the purr of a great cat playing with its prey you mean just what you say at present by morning you may change your mind otherwise i'm afraid we'll have to use other methods go into the bedroom now i'm sorry you will have to bear with all that's left of dear frank for a while but we'll remove the body later good night to you and sweet dreams bill saw that jake stood by the door with the automatic menacing him once more without a word he got to his feet and walked into the bedroom behind him the door closed and he heard a bolt shot home in the soft glow from rose-shaded lamps bill saw that this room was also of good size 
the place reminded him of those impossible boudoir bedrooms one sees portrayed on the screen the bed was a huge canopied affair of gilt and rose and stood on a dais at one end of the room twenty or thirty small pillows covered with rose-coloured silk were piled at the head on a rose damask coverlet the walls and ceiling of the room were of white painted wood with panels of rose silk framed in gilt on the hardwood floor a rose rug silk piled was spread a chaise lounge wicker armchairs and mirrored tables laden with jars and bottles all bore out the same color scheme bill thought that all that was needed to complete the screen picture was a movie actress lying back against the pillows being served with breakfast on a tray by a french maid gosh what a dump he looked about him but saw no sign of hank he investigated the two closed doors at one end of the room found that one led into the wardrobe closet where thirty or forty of slim suits hung on padded hangers together with numberless other articles of wearing apparel on the shelves the other door opened into a rose-tiled bathroom onyx shelves held piles of towels sponges soap bath salts and glass jars and in one corner stood a large wicker hamper painted rose-color bill noticed that the single stained glass window high in the bathroom wall was barred that gave him a new slant on the plan he went into the bedroom and pulled the curtains back from the two windows there both were crisscrossed with heavy bars of steel slim johnson's bedroom was well protected from all intruders and he bill bolton was as effectually a prisoner as though he had been cast into an underground dungeon he stood near the door to the sitting-room and through the panels he could hear the mumble of voices instinctively he moved nearer and placed his ear against the keyhole slim johnson was speaking give him an hour he'll be in bed and asleep by that time then go in there and remove the um, laundry better take aleck with you it will be heavy come along with me now i've got to see dago mike about that shipment he landed tonight it won't take long and then we can come back to this job if the big boss makes us let that lad go after we torture him in the morning what he doesn't know about the laundry won't hurt anybody eh bill heard johnson giggle and then the door slammed to the corridor he straightened himself thoughtfully stared at the bed and saw that a pair of silk pajamas rose-hued had been laid out on the coverlet slowly he walked into the bathroom again the next instant he had the lid of the hamper open and disclosed to view a bundle of soiled shirts crumpled pajamas collars and handkerchiefs bill scattered these articles to right and left then uncontrollably he shrank back huddled in the basket doubled awry was the body of a man only the head and shoulders were visible but the head was the head of hank End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sandsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter sixteen through the skylight bill bent swiftly caught up some of the dirty linen and flung it into the hamper he had to pull himself together that that was the explanation of course for slim johnson's cryptic remarks about the laundry they were coming back in an hour would they take the hamper and all yes he decided it would mean just that not even a gangster beer baron or whatever role slim johnson plays in the criminal life of this state would permit him to carry dead bodies through the public halls of a hotel without causing comment and possibly another police raid no hank was going out in the hamper how many more he wondered had travelled that route before and would travel it again like a flash the idea came to him of course it would be necessary to remove the body he went back to the bedroom and threw himself down on the chaise lounge he was tired after his long hop and felt nauseated from his experience that evening 
a glance at his watch showed that it still lacked a few minutes to ten o'clock he had been in gring's hotel only an hour and in that short time murder resolutely he put the thought from him and the thought of what he soon must do his eyes closed and gradually he dozed off into light slumber it was a quarter to eleven when bill awoke chimes on a church clock somewhere in the neighborhood were striking the quarter hour with a cry of annoyance he sprang to the locked door and listened no sound came from the sitting-room hastily extinguishing the bedroom lights he hurried into the bathroom and switched on a single electric bulb he began to work with feverish haste lifting the limp body of hank from the hamper rigor mortis had not yet set in he carried it to the bed removed the coat and waistcoat slipped on the jacket of the pajamas turned down the rose-colored sheet and covered the body all but the head and one arm which appeared above the coverlet in a natural position bill was trembling like a leaf when that was accomplished but the worst was over he had now only to switch off the bathroom light and take the place of hank in the clothes hamper he collected the linen he had scattered on the floor turned off the light and got into the hamper with his armful of shirts and pajamas arranging himself as comfortably as he could inside the lid was hinged and fell back upon him when he had drawn a few pieces of clothing over his head and assumed the position formerly occupied by hank he crouched half stifled in the hamper listening for ages it seemed at last the bolt of the sitting-room door clicked from within his hiding-place bill could hear almost clearly what was happening in the room there came the faint creak of a boot on the floor boards keep to the rug you fool hissed johnson's voice do you want to wake him for several minutes there was no other sound in his mind's eye he pictured the young gangster tiptoeing to the bed and looking down on the rose-colored pajamas suddenly they were beside him the hamper was dragged away from the wall lifted and let down on the tiles again holy smoke what a weight a voice whispered hoarsely shut up and come on again the hamper was lifted and carried from the room outside in the corridor it was set down for a moment while its bearers locked the door then the angle at which bill was being carried shifted the basket rocked slowly up and down as he descended the stairs there were a great many stairs they seemed endless twice he was set down roughly while the men paused for breath he had a desperate impulse to thrust open the lid tear away the suffocating clothes and strike out for freedom but the time was not yet he must be patient the air became cooler and he was able to breathe more freely he thought they must be in the open now the hamper was banged down again slim a voice spoke somewhere above and he and he recognized it as jake's doesn't want the bulls to get on to this you remember last time they dug up otto and raised an awful stink well what about this stiff oh hank's in luck he gets a christian burial there's one of them private family cemeteries up Silvermine way hank goes in there the tools are in the car it's just too bad slim can't do his own digging growled number two not him he's got a heavy date there he is now watching from the lobby when we're out of sight he'll beat it he ain't even taken a bodyguard tonight what is it a skirt how should i know but if we don't get going he will start raising the roof get hold of this thing again she'll go on the back again bill was lifted the basket swung violently then landed with a jar that shook his bones he sensed that rope was being passed around the hamper to secure it to the back of the car there came the crisp slam of a door a continuous vibration and a violent jerk they were off at last the car was moving bill waited until he felt the automobile swerve around the corner then he thrust upward with all his might the flimsy wicker catch snapped the lid flew back and amid a cascade of soiled laundry he crawled out and dropped to the roadway an instant later he was strolling back toward the hotel his late conveyance had already disappeared around the corner swinging into the street upon which gring's hotel fronted 
halfway down the block he saw slim johnson run down the steps and enter a taxicab the car was headed away from him and started off directly bill at once sprinted after it hoping that the boston post road traffic would hold it up at the end of the block his hope was fulfilled the cab slowed down stopped and waited for the green light bill had just time to grasp the spare tire on the rear and take a precarious seat on the inner rim when it started up again across the post road and under the raised tracks of the new york new haven and hartford it went then into that network of mean streets between the railroad and the shore like a frightened cat up a back alley near the harbor the car slowed down and drew up before an open lot bill dropped off and hid behind a pile of rubbish slim johnson got out paid off the driver and started away at a smart pace toward the docks with his weather eye open bill followed him running swiftly across the patches of light from the street lamps and seeking the shadow the gangster followed the harbor toward the seafront wending his way among the wharves at length by the side of the pier he stopped and gave a shrill whistle bill stepped behind a small wooden hut and took a survey lying out among other vessels was the white prow of a large yacht he could just discern its lines in the dim moonlight there was a lantern at the bows and a glimmer at one or two of the portholes soon he heard the creak and dip of oars and could see the silver sparkle of flashing water a small boat drew into the pier slim made his way carefully down the steps disappearing from bill's view there was the rasp of an oar on stonework as the boat was pushed off bill could distinguish the man's lisping tones as he talked then the boat melted into the darkness in the general direction of the yacht for a few minutes bill gazed across the water at its outlines suddenly there was a bright flood of light upon the deck a door flung open a tall figure blocked it and the light narrowed to a slit and winked out as the door closed again while bill stood watching from the pier he would have given anything to know who the others were on board that vessel still hot with anger and horror at being forced to witness the dastardly crime and sickened with the part he had had to play later bill was not in the mood to forego an opportunity of evening things up it came to his mind that even to approach the yacht in a small boat keeping his eyes and ears open might be of some help in learning who was aboard her or perhaps yield him a clue to the truth about slim johnson's business but a small boat was not easy to procure at that time of night and in any case he did not want any inquisitive soul to know what he was doing as he walked slowly along the wharf his foot struck a rope and looking down he saw it held a small dinghy that lay in the water at the edge of the dock it probably belonged to a yachtsman who had come ashore a find if ever he needed one no time now to have any compunctions about its owner bill looked across at the yacht with its portholes showing dim glints of light and in a trice he was on his knees he slipped the knot of the rope and hurried down the wet steps the white yacht was farther out than he had thought and when he reached it he was astonished at its size and magnificence a shaft of light burst from the door where he had seen the gangster enter johnson appeared on deck and bill was actually so near that he could see the pleased expression on his smiling face the dinghy drifted under the yacht's bows and he was shut out from view but he could hear slim's feet passing along the deck and clattering down the companionway then there was the sharp slam of a door softly bill sculled along at the side of the yacht over the portholes curtains were drawn so he could see nothing of what was going on inside the moon was hidden behind clouds and it was now so dark that he nearly ran into a tiny wooden landing stage as he paused with the dinghy close under the narrow steps he could hear the clink of dishes as if a late meal was being prepared and a skylight nearby threw the sound of excited conversation out on to the deck each moment bill kept reminding himself that he ought to be getting back what if the owner of the dinghy were to appear and send angry halloos across the water 
still having got so far to retire without finding out what johnson was up to seemed stupid he made up his mind he would take a quick survey of the deck before moving off he slung the rope around the bottom rung of the ladder and cautiously felt his way upward the deck was empty so far as he could make out if a hand was supposed to be on watch bill could not hear or see any signs of him the large skylight came into view on deck and the shimmer of its thick glass indicated that the saloon below was lighted up bill crouched at the rail listening the snatches of animated talk he had heard from the water must have come from this saloon for he could see that one of the skylight windows was raised a couple of inches now he could distinguish through the opening the clear tones of two voices in particular with the utmost caution bill crawled a couple of yards forward and looked down into the saloon there was a white damask covered table with shaded lights at which sat two men busy with supper and conversation he recognized the men at once slim johnson's languid gestures emphasized his words as he directed them between sips of coffee to no less a person than zenas sanders himself with a gasp bill realized that sanders had come by plane and that this yacht must be the leader's present headquarters to go back now was out of the question he might be on the brink of a vital discovery he glanced up and down the deck still it was deserted pulling himself close to the skylight he lay listening with every muscle taut slim johnson was speaking and at first bill could not pick up the trend of his remarks but when sanders replied he realized their talk had been bearing on himself and the interview at green's hotel you're right slim said sanders young bolton has practically broken with evans all he cares about now is getting the kid back he said so over the phone well that darn indian is sure to find your hideaway sanders he's got plenty of guts and so has that parker fellow by all reports between them they'll get the boy before this yacht has a chance to reach twin heads harbor sanders laughed and shook his head in a nervous negative oh no they won't he chuckled the boy isn't up there i brought him with me at present he's sound asleep in a cabin not twenty feet from where we're sitting well that's a good one slim laughed what's the orders now we sail in two hours i want you to come along go back to the hotel now and use your gentle persuasion on bill bolton to find out where evans is we'll hold them on board until the divers have brought the stuff up from the bottom of the harbor up there then we can either make all three of them pay heavy ransoms or if they're obdurate tie them up and drop them overboard but supposing torture won't make bolton tell argued slim what shall i do with him then you aren't giving me much time to persuade him you know oh use your air-gun if you like it's all the same to me and let old evans go that's right he's tired of trying to watch us up there and that old diver of his jim something or other hasn't located the stuff yet evans thinks that he has a better bet in watching you so mind your step when you come back tonight the longer mr evans stops in stamford the better pleased i'll be okay it's a swell break and the luckiest thing about it is that he can't bring in the bulls he and his bank would pay a pretty fine if the government found out that he was taking that gold to europe in his yacht when von heimskirt captured it nice of the noble baron to sink it in twin heads harbor and then go to atlanta for thirty or forty years we may be able to blackmail evans later after he's paid his ransom and we've got away with the gold listen sanders dropped his voice and began to whisper across the table bill pressed closer to the skylight and at the same time a door clicked somewhere along the deck in a second he was crouching on hands and knees peering into the darkness the figure of a man swung up the companionway and paused to light a cigarette bell could see his thin swarthy face lined and scarred as the tiny flame leapt within his cupped palms the match spun overboard in a luminous curve and hissed into the water then the man began to walk slowly along the deck 
toward bill end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter seventeen bill's way the moment that the match struck the water found bill wriggling across the deck like a sand eel the red tip of the cigarette in the man's mouth glowed and waned as he drew in the smoke a bright point in the darkness it moved forward and in its soft luster bill could distinguish the shiny peak and white linen top of the man's yachting cap beneath which his face was a dim brown blur everything else was in black obscurity as quickly as a cat bill slipped down the ladder and pressing his body against the side of the yacht lay motionless it was unlikely that the man would descend for bill had seen no boat tethered at the tiny square stage below and now he prayed that this yacht's officer would not select the spot directly above him to pause for contemplation of the night sky the man drew nearer hesitated as if halted by the sound of talk in the saloon below then passed on the slow tread of his rubber soles grew fainter and bill knew that he had strolled to the other side of the deck now was his chance for an instant he glanced down at the dinghy that would be the easier way but well there was no telling what might happen if he went ashore he hastily unlaced his shoes stuffed them in his coat pocket and bending low ran lightly along the deck toward the door whence the officer had emerged down the companionway he darted and at the bottom found himself in a narrow passage which bisected this part of the yacht fore and aft being familiar with this type of craft he guessed that the passage ran forward from the saloon where slim and sanders were still conferring to the galley and the crew's quarters on either side were the closed doors of the cabins he listened for a second at the door nearest the stairs turned the knob and pushed it open that's you peterson inquired a sleepy voice from within the dark cabin the owner wants young evans in the saloon growled bill trusting that his voice sounded not too unlike peterson's who he guessed was finishing his smoke on deck he was without weapon of any kind if the man in the cabin became suspicious he must run for it he heard a prodigious yawn well i ain't that kid's nurse he grumbled you ought to know he's in number three the key's in the door fetch him yourself high tides at two bells and we shove off then for the love of mike get out of here and let me cash forty winks bill hurriedly closed the door and looked around for number three there was a night light burning in the passage and by its dim rays he soon found the cabin just forward of the companionway he unlocked it slipped inside and shut the door after him say piped a shrill voice and one that he recognized this time what's the big idea for the twenty-seventh time i'll tell you i don't know where my father is and i care less beat it and let a feller sleep pipe down charlie it's bill bill almost shrieked the boy gee whiz but i'm glad you've come it's so dark in here i thought never mind what you thought hustle it up kid we've got to get out of here in a hurry wait till i get my clothes on bill felt rather than saw the small figure beside him and caught charlie's arm no time for clothes you're wearing something what is it one of old sanders nightshirts charlie ruefully returned it's a million sizes too big as usual they chuck anything at a who do you think you are whispered bill the prince of wales he pulled charlie toward the door opened it and looked out someone was coming down the companionway whistling yankee doodle and flatting horribly bill jerked back kept the cabin door on a crack and waited presently a door further down the passage slammed and yankee doodle was suddenly and mercifully cut short bill wasted no time into the corridor followed by charlie he sprang number three was hurriedly locked and the two ran up the companionway their bare feet making no noise on the brass-bound rubber treads both lads leapt across the deck slithered into the dinghy 
and pushed off the tide was on the flood and made a splashing noise against the hull sufficient to muffle the click of the oars as bill dropped them into the rowlocks dreading his teeth he took three or four long strokes and then sat still in the swing of the tide the dinghy drifted silently away from the vessel and was lost among other crafts at anchor nearby they gave the yacht a wide berth one lad at the oars the other crouched in the stern of the rowboat bill used its lights however to get his bearings on the pier steps he half expected some angry yachtsman to be waiting with threats to wring his neck for such barefaced robbery they were still a couple of hundred yards off the wharf when a sea-going tug swung round the riding lights of an anchored sloop bill heard the clang of the engine-room bell and almost directly the powerful craft slowed down her propeller blades churning the water to foam a voice hailed them from the deck forward dingy ahoy skull over here and let's see who ye are who wants to know piped up charlie the stamford harbor police patrol wants to know sonny that's who give us no more of your luck come aboard and let's see what you got in that there rowboat coming said bill and pulled toward the tug which was drifting slowly with the tide they were but a few yards off her side when a blinding light struck the dinghy why didn't you get that dumb thing working before pat growled another voice above their heads them ain't the guys we're looking for there ain't no booze aboard that dinghy nothing but a couple of lads and one of em stole his grandmother's nightshirt grandmother your eye sang out charlie who knew he looked ridiculous and was in no mood to appreciate the tug crew's laughter shut up kid ordered bill and then in a louder voice we are looking for the police there's worse than booze running going on out here to-night any objection to our coming aboard come aboard bub tell us your troubles they were helped overside by a man in trousers and a cotton undershirt upon closer inspection he proved to be a short and stubby individual with very black eyes and hair and a round face badly in need of a shave and now what's the matter he asked are you in command of this craft i am young man sergeant duffy's the name now let's have your monikers and all about it my name is bolton i live in new canaan began bill what not the midshipman whose name was in all the papers for capturing that pirate liner i guess said bill i have to plead guilty to that charge sergeant duffy shook him warmly by the hand i recognize ye now from the pictures he beamed i'm glad to meet ye sir it's an honor it is and the young man wid ye he'll be charlie evans if i'm not mistaken where in the seven seas did ye locate the lad his father had his kidnapping broadcasted to-night but it said them fellies had got him away down east clayton maine was the place well i found him locked up aboard that yacht the one that's showing lights over there the katrina i didn't know her name the katrina's right cut in charlie a fellow by the name of sanders is the owner offered the sergeant he lives on shippen point that said bill is the guy anyway he's in cahoots with slim johnson the gangster whom i saw murder a man called hank to-night they're both on board the katrina now and i have every reason to believe that sanders was the brains of von heimskirk's pirate gang that yacht by the way is shoving off her main at the turn of the tide oh no she ain't declared the policeman by gorry we'll attend to the katrina in a jiffy i'm sending it ashore with kelly he's got to call up headquarters and you can phone mr evans at the same time can't we go with you and see the fun begged charlie no you can't young man you're my responsibility now and the two of ye have had enough excitement for to-night i'll be thinking we're very much obliged to you sergeant said bill shaking hands again sergeant duffy shook his bullet head it's me who's thanking you sir this is big business in our line it's the chance i've been waiting more than five years for it will mean my lieutenancy mr bolton and just remember sir if any of them dumb motorcycle cops hold ye up for speeding any time 
tell em you're a friend of duffy's if they don't let ye go i'll break em bill grinned and nodded and they hurried overside into the dinghy where a husky policeman was already at the oars beat it kelly duffy flung after them and phoned the chief to break out a bunch of his black feet and get em down to the wharf on the run now you men they heard him say as they drew away from the patrol boat rip them covers off the guns and get under way the katrina over yonder's got a bunch of murder and kidnappers on her and we're the lads what will run em in the cells sure as st patrick run the snakes out of the old country the wharf was deserted after nodding the dinghy's painter to an iron ring bolt the lads followed kelly across the rough planking to the small shack bill had hidden behind while watching slim johnson kelly produced a key and went inside from the doorway they heard him call police headquarters and pour forth the sergeant's message into the phone well bill said charlie you certainly handed sanders and his bunch a red-hot wallop what will they do to them do you think murder is a hanging matter in this state charlie and kidnapping means a long term in state's prison when sanders and company get through with that there will still be a federal charge of piracy against them on the flying fish job that we cleaned up a few weeks ago he broke off as kelly came out and told him he could use the phone two minutes later he had mr evans on the wire bill bolton speaking sir he said i've found charlie he's safe and sound and with me now thank god bill heard him exclaim and went on talking i'm sorry i was so rude early this evening he apologized i misjudged you sir i understood how you felt bill but i'd already broadcasted the boys abduction when you called and but never mind about that now where are you and what's happened bill gave him a hurried resume of the evening's adventures sanders said charlie's father got one thing wrong i wasn't transporting that gold to europe in the merry maid it was bound for two banks in new orleans ten million dollars of it the reason i didn't call in the police was not because i feared federal censure but because i was afraid if sanders was frightened he would drop death bombs on the place and scatter the gold so that no one could find it i knew it had been sunk by von heimskirk and his pirates somewhere off twin heads but had no idea it was in the harbor now we'll get it easily enough and that reminds me deborah telephoned half an hour ago osceola found sanders headquarters this afternoon he had an armed camp in the woods across the harbor from turner's the chief got the state's police on the job and tonight they captured the place and every man jack of them except sanders who you say is aboard his yacht down here wait a minute interrupted bill he listened while kelly called to him from the open doorway the policeman with us he continued says the katrina has been taken he can see the prisoners being moved aboard the patrol boat he also tells me he will run us up town in his flipper good-bye for the present i'll have charlie with you just as soon as we can get there five minutes later while they were being driven toward the heart of stamford in the police car charlie turned to his friend gee whiz bill i clean forgot to thank you for getting me away from that gang bill laughed don't mention it kid you'd do the same for me any day i know charlie smiled complacently i sure would bill he declared but take it from me if you're going to get kidnapped bring a pair of pajamas along these nightshirts make a monkey out of a man End of chapter seventeen end of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sansbury